Come in. They were all here at one time, farmers, gamblers, politicians. They came because it was a new land, and for many of them, a new way of life. It was here that they helped spin and weave the threads of statehood, here in yesterday's capital. Nearly three quarters of a century have passed since the first sweaty homesteader drove stakes into his 160 acres of soil near Guthrie, the principal town in the land best described as unassigned. There are a few people in Guthrie who still remember those days, but not many. Tranquil the spot where men squabbled over land, and few men realized they walked the same streets territorial governors took on their way to work. There are tall, bright buildings, like the post office building that is relatively new to Guthrie. But it's the old ones that remind you that this was more than another frontier town. There's something about them that speaks of pride. Some of them are locked up now, boarded and closed in favor of their more modern kin. Their spires and domes remind you if you look at them. But most people don't look and remember that William Wrigley started a chewing gum business over there or that a man started bottling dandereen hair tonic in that basement and made a fortune. The buildings are left for children to study, and they are told that it all started here. The Santa Fe drove its tracks into this territory in 1887. The construction crews built a wooden shack and named their town Deer Creek. It was later changed to Guthrie in honor of John Guthrie, district judge in Topeka, Kansas. This is what started it all, a railroad track right to the heart of some of the last homestead land in the United States. The Santa Fe Depot absorbed the awesome shock of 15 trainloads of land-hungry homesteaders on that warm spring day of April 22, 1889. They had packed themselves into the coaches, and many made the harrowing ride on the tops of the cars. Others strung themselves across cowcatchers and bribed engineers with whiskey and money to ride in the locomotive after making sure they would be on the first train into the promised land. Everyone ran in those first few hours. Most of them didn't know where they were running, but they had been told this land was rich, and they intended to get their share of the riches one way or another. There were businessmen, speculators, doctors, lawyers, gamblers, and those that were just seeking excitement in an exciting new land. But most of the thousands who rushed in that first day were looking for land, sweet, rich soil where they could raise a good crop and a strong family. Not all of them came by railroad, but followed in their own fashion. Many of them got there too late and went dejectedly about the process of bargaining for a lot or settling a little farther from town. The federal land office began filing claims immediately. A post office was opened after the run by Dennis T. Flynn, later Oklahoma's first congressman. Letters from waiting wives were precious to men looking for home. Within six hours after the start of the run at high noon, Guthrie was a city of tents. They had blossomed by the thousands, and they were more than just sheltered. The government required the land be improved, and housing came under that category. Sheets and boards were all a man needed. By nightfall, there wasn't a settler who would budge from his new home in Guthrie. It wasn't long before those who desired to make a good life in Guthrie realized that they had been drawn into a new land by federal authorities who failed to make provisions for civil law and order. The more dominant leaders quickly called for meetings. Federal law stated no town site could take more than 320 acres of land, so four separate town sites were established. There was East Guthrie, West Guthrie, 
South Guthrie and Capitol Hill. Each town site handled its own election. There wasn't much time for a campaign. The cries of fraud wrecked the first try, but there were determination and law and order. Democracy reigned through a direct vote of the people. Men lined up in columns, and a man on horseback recorded their votes as they passed. Not a single act of violence marred the establishment of government. Civil engineers began the serious process of laying out streets and alleys for the townships. The unfortunate homesteader who found his lot was in the way of progress was given 10 hours to move with no compensation for his land. Money is what they came for and business set up with or without the luxury of shelter from the sun and the dust. Every kind of enterprise found its way into Guthrie in those first few days but hotels and restaurants were in the majority, and they could be found in every size and price range. A visitor noted that nothing in that dirty, dusty town is painted except the ladies. It took a strong man to earn his living off this land. Many of them had wandered from as far away as Europe and found themselves living on bean soup for 10 cents a bowl and spending their nights in a tent, if they were lucky enough to have a tent. Their earnings and labor was put into the soil of this, their land. Lumber had been stacked by the side of the railroad tracks for months in preparation for the land opening, and it wasn't long before every able-bodied man was helping to build a town. During the first month, the train depot received 1,600 more carloads of lumber, and during the first eight days, the depot receipts were greater than for either Wichita or Kansas City. There was work enough for everyone if you were enterprising enough to find it. One character by the name of Button Mary roamed the dusty streets with needle and thread, sewing on missing buttons for men who were not fortunate enough to have their wives or sweethearts with them. Since Button Mary seldom gave her clients the chance to remove their clothing before her services began. Many of them refused to pay. A sharp needle often changed their minds. It was difficult to get bricks in Guthrie in the early days, so two brothers began making them. The first batch failed. But a man from Iowa showed them how it was done, and these more substantial buildings began going up. They were a few of the buildings that withstood the ravages of Oklahoma tornadoes those first months. Banks were plentiful in Guthrie. Those permanent ones that went into buildings were among the first in Oklahoma. There were others, however, that began business in nothing more than lean-tos or tents. A Santa Fe railroad worker took advantage of this early arrival in Guthrie and acquired some land. He sold it to a homesteader who was later moved off because it was in the middle of the street. The railroader put his money into a tent bank and the next morning found the bankers had closed their business and mysteriously stolen away. Gamblers plied their trade anywhere they could find a group of men in a clear piece of ground on the street or in an alley. Many an acre of land changed hands in a game of Pharaoh or poker. City ordinances later moved the games inside, and gambling hall owners paid the city $70 a month in taxes, this being the only other revenue outside of fines. Although the houses advertised their love of a square deal, it was wise to keep an eye on the dealer. In true frontier fashion, the seamy side of life was shielded from the children by books on reading, writing, and arithmetic. The first free public schools in Oklahoma were opened in October of 1889 under a joint program of all four townships. 
classrooms were found in private homes and in the larger building's storage rooms. Truant officers occasionally found some of the more worldly pupils watching the federal officers pour whiskey down the throat of a careless bootlegger. Federal law stated simply, no fire water in the land of the red man. Jugs were broken while parched throats felt like they would crack at the sight of good whiskey going to waste. Even cider was outlawed, and an old newspaper article states that some of the more straight-laced residents suspected the selling of hop tea, a beverage described by the reporter as looking like beer but tasting like slop. Claim jumpers, and especially Sooners, settlers that had slipped into Guthrie before the opening date, also met the wrath of the more law-abiding citizens. This picture was posed to warn others against the practice of claiming someone else's land. The practice was fairly common and it was encouraged by the poor processing of claims handled by the federal agents in the first maddening hours. Arbitration boards were set up to handle these disputed property claims and the members were not the type of men that could easily be swayed by emotion. The members worked by the hour and some complained they took too long but when they reached a decision, it was not to be changed. The winner in the hearing was usually hoisted to the shoulders of his friends and neighbors, while others watched and cheered the cause of justice and the downfall of another Sooner. In 1890, Oklahoma Territory was created, and a Union War veteran from Indianapolis, George W. Steele, became the first governor with his offices in Guthrie. Saloons were legalized and bad water was passed over in favor of worse whiskey. William Wrigley, a salesman, noted the demand for something that would kill the taste. He sprinkled paraffin with flavor extract and started a chewing gum business. Tom Mix served drinks in the Bluebell Saloon and apparently did a pretty good job. Cottonwood Creek on the outskirts of Guthrie comes out of its banks once a year to do more damage to patients than to property. But there was a time when this creek yielded food and water. Water out of the Cottonwood Creek sold for a nickel a cup for the first few days in Guthrie before a community well was opened. There was also food from the Cottonwood, and more than one youngster spent the afternoon on the banks of the creek to catch the evening meal. Fish were plentiful in the cottonwood and also the nearby Cimarron. But when you could catch two catfish for a total weight of 100 pounds, they were worth parading down the street. Other game was abundant in the open prairie surrounding the town sites, and it was said that if a man had a gun, he could live. But if he had a gun and a dog, he could live well. There were other forms of entertainment for those with more discriminating tastes. The club theater was a professional group of obviously sophisticated thespians whose shows were the forerunners to those presented in the Brooks Opera House in the 1890s. A stagehand by the name of Lon Chaney got his start in the theater by working at the Brooks Opera House for $3 a week while sleeping on a cot backstage. Weddings became an excuse for the socially prominent to prove that they were as culturally savvy as their neighbors at Kansas City or St. Louis. A newspaper article noted one wedding as a gathering of representative men, beautiful women, and elegant costumes. There was a certain amount of prestige connected with having an army troop stationed near outside the city. Military dances and dashing young men on horseback caused many a young lass's heart to beat a little more rapidly than was socially proper. The officers seemed to enjoy their leisure, but as far as the enlisted man was concerned, it was a dog's life. All in all, 
Guthrie residents boasted that their town stood on equal footing with any in the West for modern conveniences, including St. Louis and Kansas City. Within four months, they had the fourth electric light plant west of the Mississippi. There were 30 arc lamps on the streets, and some 500 homes and businesses had electricity. City revenue boomed when the city council passed an ordinance to collect occupation taxes. It cost a blacksmith or a peanut vendor $10 to $12 a year to operate and $100 a day for a circus. All occupations except ministers were taxed and they earned their own money by preaching in front of gambling houses until the owners paid them to take the gospel elsewhere. Fines were another source of much needed revenue. It cost as much as $25 to talk in a boisterous manner on the streets of East Guthrie. And in Guthrie proper, it was a misdemeanor for women to appear on the streets dressed in men's clothing or in any other unusual or sensational manner. Indians weren't taxed, but they were fined along with everyone else for riding their horses faster than six miles per hour along the streets. They came to town occasionally to confer with their federal agents, but they shook their heads in wonder at the strange ways of the white man and rode back to their reservations. The women brought their men to town on sale days when $2 hats sold for 50 cents and imported dotted Swiss went for 5 cents a yard. They wondered what had happened to the good old days. There was even a stagecoach and a freight wagon that made regular runs from Chandler and on to Kingfisher. It was a growing town, and the citizens who helped build it were proud of their work. There were wagons that sprayed the streets with water to keep the dust down, just like the big cities. The homesteaders continued to work and live on the land that would be theirs in five years. Crops were beginning to pay off, and if a man had some help, he could build a comfortable home from wood and sod. Those that stayed the first few years weren't about to leave their land. Shortly after the turn of the century, an impressive building went up to house the publishing offices of the state capitol, the only paper to publish on the day of the run and survive. By 1905, Guthrie's Chamber of Commerce advertised modern city living with 50 miles of brick and concrete sidewalks and an impressive six miles of streetcar track and the streetcars to go with them. Guthrie's City Hall was just four years old when the members of the Constitutional Convention met there in 1906 to outline the laws for the future state of Oklahoma. The convention was in session for almost a full year before a constitution could be written and sent to Washington for approval. Some of the territory's most prominent political leaders attended the convention that paved the way to statehood under the stern eye and heavy gavel of their presiding president, Alfalfa Bill Murray. Then on November 16, 1907, came the long-awaited day of statehood. Crowds gathered about the steps of the Carnegie Library for the inauguration of the state's first governor, Charles N. Haskell. That morning, President Theodore Roosevelt had signed the statehood proclamation, and within three minutes, a special telegraph wire had sent the news to Guthrie, where gunshots and wild exultations greeted the news. For three years, the Capitol remained in Guthrie. On June 11, 1910, a special vote was taken to determine whether the Capitol should be in Guthrie, Shawnee, or Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City won by a large majority, and Governor Haskell ordered the state seal be moved. Legend has it that William B. Anthony, personal secretary to the governor, went to Guthrie the night of the election, removed the seal from the Capitol offices in a bundle of dirty laundry, and rushed it to Oklahoma City after a high-speed chase by a group of angry Guthrie citizens. Anthony did take the seal, but Earl Keyes, who was state official at the time of the removal, said later that Anthony and other state officials came to Guthrie the day after the election in broad daylight. Sam Anthony handed me this note uh -huh. from uh, Mr. Cross. Uh -huh. I read it, and uh, something like that, uh, Earl, please uh, deliver the great seal in the state of Oklahoma to and that was the first time you knew what it was all about. That's right. I That's see. Correct. So what did you do? So I went back into the vault. We uh, kept the uh, uh, 
steel and the constitution in uh, what we call the iron chest. It wasn't particularly safe, it was uh, just a kind of a home job. And uh, I opened the safe, or opened the chest, and uh, took the steel out. And uh, when I, uh, when I uh, closed this, the uh, chest, came back into the uh, large room, and sat down at the typewriter and typed out a receipt. And uh, uh, for, Mr. Craw for uh, Mr. Anthony to receive me for the seal. Mm -hmm. And uh, he received me. And uh, I don't know just what I'd done with those papers. I don't know. Uh, they should be valuable today. Uh, I'd sure like to have them. And he took the seal and left. And, uh, yeah, we, I, I got a piece of, of uh, craft wrapping paper uh -huh. and uh, wrapped it up. And uh, he put, stuck it under his arm, walked out the door, locked the door. And we walked down the hall. And uh, uh, Julie Williamson opened the door again, and Gail walked out in the car, and, and, and broke home that's all there was, and I went back home. Governor Haskell's office was set up in the Lee Huckins Hotel. The citizens of Guthrie pointed to the Enabling Act, which said the Capitol could not be moved until 1913. But through the bitter words and court trial, the Capitol remained in Oklahoma City. This is the Avon Hotel in the first block east of Harrison Street. It used to be called the Royal Hotel, and a spacious auditorium housed the Brooks Opera House. John Philip Sousa and his Marine Band played here. Oklahoma's first metropolitan newspaper used to be in this building. Across the street and in the basement, F.M. Knowlton started selling his hair tonic called Dandarine. He died a millionaire. There are a lot of other landmarks still standing in Guthrie. Others, like the old city hall, have been torn down. Guthrie is peaceful today. The noise and bustle of a town that had a state to build is gone. That's all history. But there are few towns that have the privilege of being so completely surrounded with history. There are those few persons left who can still tell you the tales of the old days. But it's all still here in the buildings of yesterday's capital.